This is the Master Brewers Podcast, brought to you by the Master Brewers Association of the Americas, a volunteer organization dedicated to continually improving the products and processes of our membership since 1887. Let's go! 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 Master Brewers brings you interviews with the industry's best and brightest in brewing science, technology, and operations. As you all know, Master Brewers is a nonprofit organization. You probably also realize that it's expensive to produce shows like the Master Brewers podcast every week. If you're a vendor, please consider sponsoring the Master Brewers podcast. It'll cost you less than you probably spent to sponsor that last district meeting, and your message will reach the thousands of brewers who tune in each week. Click contact from masterbrewerspodcast.com to learn more. inside joke among brewers and especially among maltsters is you know you blame the maltster but the right thing we all know to do is to to check check things inside your own house first this week on the show what would you do after noticing an extract drop in your brew house we heard how one group of brewers tackled this problem back on episode 32 This time we hear how the winners of the 2017 Brewing and Malting Science course took a different approach to the same problem. Hi, my name is Simon Nielsen and I'm with Central Waters Brewing Company. Simon, what problem did the course director give your group to solve? You are the brewing manager responsible for the operation of a brew house of 50,000 barrels a year. Uh, Recently, your brewery shifted malt suppliers, the malt you were receiving, and your new malt supply had similar malt analysis and were also similar in the barley varieties. When you started using the new malt, you noted a a significant drop in recovered extract in the brew house. Explain what approach you would take to identify, verify, and correct this loss of extract. So how did your group decide to tackle this project? Where did you start? Once we decided... You know, we're going to we're going to come at this in a way where we're going to go, you know, let's co- let's identify all the ways we could do this and let's trace it back. Like let's let's actually tackle this like the real world where this is our brewery. What what would we actually do? Um because a lot of us like I said we're head brewers, we're brewmasters in our brewery and it's like okay, we're having this issue. What would we actually do? So it's like okay, we're going to look at our mill, we're going to look at what's going on in our lauder ton and our in our mash ton and so we just we came up with our process flow and we just started to um break it down from there and and the reality is is you know you know the inside joke among brewers and especially among maltsters is you know you blame the maltster first um and you know but the right thing we all know to do is to to check check things inside your own house first to make sure everything in your own house is in order first that's right you got to take a look in the mirror first you, now your group was comprised of brewers who came from breweries of all sizes presumably with some very different process flows did you just pick one of those or did you try to incorporate all of them um yeah uh we kind of just did a general a generalization you know so i mean we all have we all have mash and lauder tons you know what i mean we all had or a, or a combination of the two. Um, we all have, you know, we all have those things. We all have a brew house. We all have, we all, for the, for the most part, most of us have silos. Um, those of us that don't, you know, we have a truck that delivers bags of malt, um, for the smaller people that were had that were, you know, brew pubs in the group. Um, so for the, in, you know, in general, it was, it was all, it was all pretty applicable. So, okay. Well, walk us through that your sort of your process of elimination. Yeah. So we kind of just we kind of started just looking at the mash and lauder ton, um, and just making sure everything we were hitting all our temps in there first. We were making sure, um, you know, for whatever reason that um, our 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 uh, our thermometers were calibrated that we. Uh, we're actually hitting hitting our mash temps that for whatever reason we weren't drastically above or below them 
um, so that we weren't killing our, all of our enzymes or that we weren't actually converting, you know, we weren't way below and we weren't really actually getting much or any conversion, um, that type of thing. Uh, and just, you know, really dotting all your I's, crossing all your T's, checking all that stuff, um, making sure all your rakes, all, um, all your mixers and your vessels are working. Uh, that you're not getting big dough balls, that you're not mixing missing extract that way. Uh, Going back to your um, temperature sensors and flow meters and whatnot, did anyone in your group have some real life examples of where they'd had problems with some of that type of instrumentation? Uh, no, nobody offhand. Uh, nobody offhand had that. No. Okay. Yeah, but um, it was all stuff that you know, uh, we had learned in class and people in, you know, some of the teachers in class had given examples of that. And some of the other kids in class, some of the other students in class had, uh, had had examples of that. So we knew, I mean, it's obvious stuff that, you know, you should be looking for. Um, and, uh, and you know, it's going to bite you in the butt someday if you don't cover it. So, uh, so we checked, check all that, make sure all that stuff's working. Uh, Big thing was make sure, you know, if you have flow meters or whatever you're using to measure your water going in, make sure you're getting all your proper, uh, you know, uh, grist to water ratios, um, all that stuff. So we just looked at those things. Uh, those were all just quick checks. Um, we didn't figure it was going to be coming from those, but those are things, you know, people are going to want to look at. So we just started there. But um, after that, the obvious thing to look at was going to be our milling. So that's where we moved next. We did a sieve analysis, um, uh, made sure we were getting proper, proper crush on that. Uh, we did a, a sieve analysis both at the mill and at the grist case to make sure that, you know, we weren't uh, getting uh, any damage during conveyance from the mill to the grist case. We took the mill apart, made sure the rollers look good, checked them for excessive wear, made sure, you know, we didn't have anything big coming through, uh, that fell through the mill, damaged the rollers or that they weren't just getting worn out over time. That all checked out. If those things didn't check out, you know, we're, you're going to want to reset your mill gaps, um, to ensure that they're getting uh, all your malts getting crushed properly, uh, and, or replace and refurbish your damaged rollers. All right. So is it time to blame the maltster? Uh, not quite yet. Yeah. So now it's, it could still, there's still another step between, you know, the maltster and you, and that's, uh, storage and transport. And actually I, I did listen to, uh, to the podcast you did last year with the other winning paper. And I think, I think it was you that had the story of... Yep, yep. You're going to mention one of my favorites, the story of the impatient truck driver, right? Yeah, with a damaged malt coming in. Yep, that's the one. Yep, so, so yeah, we had, we, we, uh, you're going to want to definitely uh, look at how your malt's getting delivered to your brewery. Um, so uh, make sure that, you know, there's not, the truck isn't, the truck isn't dirty inside. You're not, your malt's not getting moldy or, um, getting, getting wet on the way to the brewery and then molding in your silo. Um, from, uh, you know, you switched to malting company, the, the malt they're giving you and the analysis that they're giving you, uh, might be the same or it might be very similar, but you know, the, the trucking company that they use is now different probably than, the old maltster you were getting your malt from and they might not be using, you know, as good of a malt, as good of a trucking company and that they might not be cleaning their trucks out as well, as well as the last company did. And now your malt's getting damp on the way to the, to the brewery and your malt's getting in the silo and now it's molding, or maybe you have an issue and, and you have, and you have uh, moisture in your silo and now it's molding. And, and uh so that can be an issue or maybe this guy you have you have uh you have one of the drivers as you said that's pulling up to the brewery and and uh 
shoving the malt in too fast because his his PSI on his truck is is set too high and and it's busting up your malt as it's getting pushed into the silo. Yeah, he's in a hurry. He wants to get home for dinner. Right, exactly. You know, and don't don't we all? So we all know what that's like. So so um yeah, so you know, those those are all things you're going to want to check and 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 those are great. Those are all great things and that's all stuff, you know, some of this stuff is stuff that I learned and I took home with me. That stuff I I didn't know. You know, I came home and and I didn't know what our 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 delivery guy. You know, we use the same the same guy to to deliver our malt all the time, and he he always does a great job. And luckily, you know, our our owner our owner's been doing this twenty years. Um, you know, I've been doing this for five years. Um, so I'm still learning a lot of stuff and this class was great. Luckily our owner was on top of it and, you know, he has, he had this, he had the spec set for us, but I didn't know, I didn't know that what it was and, you know, but it's, it, this class was great because, you know, I came home with so much knowledge on stuff like that. And luckily we were, we were already doing this. I just didn't know it. Coming up, or they have a batch that's a little high. They can blend that batch off with a batch that's lower and 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 hit that uh, average and give that spec to you. I'm John Bryce, and you're listening to the Master Brewers Podcast from the Master Brewers Association of the Americas. Here's what's coming up on the Master Brewers calendar. The District St. Paul, Minneapolis, February meeting and scholarship drive is February 8th at Surly Brewing. District St. Louis meets at O'Fallon Brewery on February 15th. The Fundamentals of Cut and Stack Labeling webinar is February 19th. District Rocky Mountain meets at AB in Fort Collins February 22nd. District Philly will be at Trogues February 23rd. District Milwaukee and the Wisconsin Brewers Guild hold a joint technical conference March 1st and 2nd at Badger State Brewing. District Mid-South meets at Mill Creek in Nashville March 2nd and 3rd. District Northern Rockies meets in Bozeman March 2nd. The District Midwest Spring Meeting is at Mad Tree Brewing March 10th. Districts Michigan and St. Louis both meet March 15th. And check out the speaker lineup for the 2018 Eastern Technical Conference March 23rd and 24th in Atlantic City. View the full count of events at mbaa.com for more details or to find a district meeting near you. Now back to the show. So yeah, you're going to want to check your PSI uh, that your malt's getting delivered at and make sure all that stuff's going good. But another thing to look at too, that's on, on the brewery side is, you know, how is your malt getting delivered from your silo into your, into your, uh, into your brewery. So you're going to want to look at your conveyance there as well. Make sure it's not getting broken up for some reason there. Make sure nothing changed there as well. Um, so yeah, so you can do a sieve analysis to look at that there. Um, a sieve analysis from wherever your malt falls from silo to pre-mill. And you can check that as well to make sure it's not getting broken up there. Okay, so now you've completely exonerated yourself from the brewery and it's time to blame the monster. <laughs> yeah, yeah, now we're, now we're there. <laughs> so so what did you look uh, at and what did you determine? Yeah. So a couple of things, you know, if, if you worked your way that far back, you know, a couple of things you can look at now, um, that we learned from this class is, you know, so, and the biggest thing I learned, you know, if you're looking at these, you know, our prompt says you have these two C COAs, you have these two certificates of analysis and they both look pretty much identical. So it's like, what's going on? Um, you know, one of the things that could be going on, and I, I can't remember if it was Joe Hertrich or Steve Presley that that talked talked quite a bit about this, and it was really interesting to me. Um, you know, and it was while we were talk, covering beta glucans uh, and S S over T, um, but they were talking about. Uh, you know, blending and how maltsters will do blending uh, with 
especially you know with base malts and and so you get you know let's say you have a spec on what you'll accept for beta glucan levels and what you'll accept for you know your your s and t levels and and you know they they malt a batch and they don't hit exactly what they have or they have a batch that's a little high they can blend that batch off with a batch that's lower and 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 hit that uh average and give that spec to you yeah we've you know we've we've had um you mentioned joe uh, we've had joe hertrick on the on the podcast a bunch of times and he's one of my favorites i always learn something from him if you go back to the first series with Joe, so that's episodes 15 through 18, which are actually some of the most downloaded episodes, one of the things Joe emphasizes is know thy barley variety. You need to be able to specify a variety or an acceptable blend of varieties, and that's a lot more important than just pressuring your maltster to tighten various COA parameters. I'll give you a real-life example. I experienced essentially the same scenario and symptoms years ago. We hadn't changed malt suppliers, but listen to the blends our maltster was sending us. I'm not, I'm not making this up. I actually dug up the logs. So, okay. dis- so December 18th, uh, 2012, uh, we got a silo with 38% 2012 Metcalf, 31% 2012 Conrad, 31% 2011 Metcalf. Uh, a few weeks later, on the, on the 7th of January, we got 69% 2012 Metcalf, 31% 2012 Copeland. And then uh, next month in February, we got another silo with 9% 2011 Metcalf, 91% 2012 Metcalf. Then later that month, we got a silo with 49% 2012 Metcalf, 1% 2011 Metcalf, 50% <laughs> Copeland. So, you know, you uh, right. our brew house performance was all over the place. Yeah. And I made the mistake of trying to tighten just about everything on the COA except barley variety. Eventually, we changed wow. to a single variety, which evened out a lot of bumps in the road. And your article zeroes in on this very important point, which is only going to get more important in this increasingly crowded industry. So often, it comes down to communication and building relationships. If, if you're a small craft brewer who hasn't put the time in to build relationships with your suppliers, who do you think is going to get the, the most suspect malt when there's not enough to go around? Right. Yeah, exactly. So let's hear more about the conclusion that your group reached, which really did have a lot to do with relationship building. Yeah, so to comment more on what you just said, um, uh, we worked our way actually from the maltster to the farmer as well. We talk a little bit about, you know, even we hit on kind of what you said, a met calf grown in Wyoming isn't the same as a met calf grown in Minnesota or Canada. And a big thing that people need to hit on is is building that relationship with their farmers um, and working together with their maltsters to talk about what their needs are. And that kind of ties back in with the blending specs and all of that. So, um, you know, the long and short of it, I really think is, you know, if you're having these issues and everything checks out in-house, you know, kind of like we talked about you need to be having those conversations with your maltster and say, Hey, what's going on? You know, we have these, we have these COAs. It's a, you're telling us everything's the same as the last time we've checked everything in house checks out. Um, is, is there something that's, is there some, what, is there something that could be different? What are you, what are you guys b- blending from? You know, what you, what you said, it sounds like you got the information from your maltster as to what they were blending with um, from b- barley varieties. So, you know, have that conversation with them. Um, yeah, and I think, I think Joe would tell you, you know, even beyond that, you know, don't wait until there's a problem to do that. Build that relationship ahead of time so that you, you understand their process and they understand your process and, um, and you can work together more closely so that you've got the, the functional malt that you need uh, to, to, to run your brew house. <laughs> That was Simon Nielsen here on the Master Brewers podcast. Each year, the winning group case study gets published in the Master Brewers Technical Quarterly. You can find Simon's paper as well as previous winners by typing case study into the industry's best search bar at mbaa.com. This was, I mean, I've been to, I've done Siebel. uh, I've done 
you know, I, I do CBC every year. I've done a handful of MBAA conferences. Uh, this was hands down the most beneficial uh, class or course I've, I've been to. Um, and they've not that the other ones haven't been great, but uh, this is so interactive and and I've. I'm a big proponent of networking of, you know, half of what you learn is, is after class when you get the time to spend with people and, uh, grab dinner and grab a beer. And you're actually, you know, talking about the issue, you know, issues you have in your brewery and you're talking about, you know, issues, you know, as it pertains to what you learned that day. And, you know, ha you, you learn so much that way as well. And that's what this class is built perfect for that. Uh, these group, these group projects encourage interaction with everybody after class as well as during class. Um, uh, and your class time, it's a long day. It's nine hours of lecturing um, every day. Uh, but it's so, if, if you like brewing and, and you love learning, it's so in depth and it's, you know, it, it's, I didn't, I didn't want it to stop after the two weeks. Like I could have done that the rest of, I could have done that the rest of the year. It was just, I can't say enough good things about it. So uh, I'm so thankful for the MBAA for, for whole, hosting that class. And, uh, I wish I could do the other two. I wish I could afford to do the other two. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's, it's great. I encourage anybody to do it. Uh, whether you're, uh, you know, at a brew pub or, um, you know, there was people all the way up to, you know, Miller Coors, engineers, uh, and whatnot. So uh, I think it really covers, it covers a lot of bases really well. As you all know, Master Brewers is a nonprofit organization. You probably also realize that it's expensive to produce shows like the Master Brewers podcast every week. If you're a vendor, please consider sponsoring the Master Brewers podcast. It'll cost you less than you probably spent to sponsor that last district meeting, and your message will reach the thousands of brewers who tune in each week. Click contact from masterbrewerspodcast.com to learn more.